Welcome, all of a Picture this. You're living off the northeast coast of England uh, more than a thousand years ago. It starts storming. Massive waves. The church bells start ringing, warning people that an attack is coming. Dozens of ships with dragon heads on the front that look like the devil come sailing up to the shore. Hundreds of giant, beautiful, blonde, bearded men such as myself come charging off the boats into your village, killing all the men in their path, taking the treasure, slaughtering innocent priests, rounding up all the attractive women, sisters, daughters, cousins to be taken away as slaves, and then burning the entire village down with everyone else, man, women, and child left in it. <laughs> this is the picture that all the Viking movies and stories that we've heard of over the past hundred years portray us. But was a raid really like this? <laughs> no, of course not. And I don't know how all of this started, because 90% of it is all a load of crap. As usual, we are being fed lies to slander our ancestors and make us ashamed of how we used to be. So this video is going to be clearing up the lies and going over the actual historical sources, records, and evidence to let you know what a raid was really like. Yes. So before we get into the sources and actual recorded history, there are three very important factors about a raid that everyone needs to know. Most of it's just common sense, but a lot of people don't have that, so we have to speak about these things a little bit. Number one, a raid was primarily for resources. It wasn't just a bunch of psychopaths sailing around because they like to hurt others. The primary reason for a raid was simple. You have something, I want it, I'm going to take it. That's all it was. Now because of this, it was very important not to completely cripple the place that you were raiding. You could go in and take the treasure and the slaves and burn the village down and completely destroy it, but then you would only get everything there one time, okay? If you went in instead and only took what you needed, took some treasure, took some food, took some things of what was necessary, and then you left, you could come back and raid that same village every single year. Much better option, right? And this is what the literary sources are going to show for the most part. Number two. The raids were done by kids. The raids were very much an initiation of coming into manhood. Not just in the Viking world, but all over the Indo-European world, too. Uh, it's a tradition for young men going back all the way to the Proto-Indo-European times when we were all one people. The Viking Age was no different. Most raids would have been kids in their teens or 20s. We even have some stories of uh, uh, young chieftains or princes, uh, 11 or 12 years old we find in a couple sagas. It would not have been fully grown <laughs> battle-hardened veterans blazing into a village. The vast majority of the time, the raid would have been some young men jumping off the long ship who barely even have any facial hair, probably just got their pubes. So this is also a way, though, that could make the raids a little bit more dangerous than if it was older battle-hardened men. Because young teenagers, you know, full of testosterone and aggression, all cooped up in a ship like that for a long time, who could take whatever they wanted pretty much with violence and face little chance of repercussions, if any at all, it probably would not be the most ethical of a bunch there. So I know, me, I was a horrible bastard at that age, but it's back then it was still very much a society based on honor and, and not being so horrible to people. But it's just kind of young bands of men in general that would have been wild and free abroad, but that doesn't reflect the whole uh, uh, brutal culture uh, of how it would have been back home. And finally, number three important point, yeah, duh, of course, all humans are capable of cruel and unkind things. I'm not going to sit here and idealize Viking raids saying that they were peaceful people and they didn't engage in any of the spoils of war. Of course they did. No shit. Anytime you get a bunch of fighting age men together and they just defeated an enemy force, they are not going to do some very kind and pleasant things to the civilians of that land who just uh, got defeated. You know, the property, goods, women, civilians. The exact same thing happens today and would happen today with every single country and culture around the world, including all of you. This is just what happens. This is just the reality of war. Of course this happens. 
The point I'm just trying to make in this video is that the Vikings were definitely some of the more ethical human beings in history, and especially at that time. Yes, of course, some of them did bad things, all humans can, uh, but they did it to a much lesser degree than anyone else at that time, as I will be showing you in a minute. Anyway, on to the sources. Um, I'm going to split it up um, into two sections. There are the Norse sources, uh, the sagas, and then there are the foreign sources, because the Norse sources about raids written uh, for in Scandinavia are going to paint a different picture than the sources from the people who actually got raided abroad, but both are equally valuable sources. Uh, so let's talk about the Norse sources first. The epitome of the Viking saga and the Viking lifestyle, Egil Saga. Again, raids and becoming a Viking were very much something a young boy looked forward to. Oh, I can't wait to grow up and be a Viking. In fact, I thought you guys would like this. That song, My Mother Told Me, that you all know that all the cringe pagans love to sing, it was actually a poem composed by a 10-year-old boy named Egil. And he had just killed one of the other children in the village. And Egil's mother was talking to him proud and saying, oh, you're going to be a great Viking one day, won't you? And then this 10-year-old boy writes this poem, My Mother Told Me, that turned into the song you all know. Fast forward to Egil's first raid. He would have been in his teens uh, with another group of young boys, and I think his brother Tudolf uh, was with him too, kind of leading it. They were all sneaking up on a farmstead where some villagers lived. They were not experienced. They were kind of still amateurs, and they got caught. They got caught. They got tied up. Um, imprisoned and they were going to be tortured to death in the morning uh, because it was actually um, a kind of a bad omen uh, to torture and kill someone in the middle of the night and I'll go into why in another video but they were going to get tortured in the morning they managed to escape but Egil uh, instead of all the others that ran back to the ship Egil came back and took some goods that he could carry and he killed the chief of the farmstead there and he took everything that he was able to carry. So this was kind of like a sneak attack and we find a lot of other examples like this. Uh, another one in Vattensdarda Saga, there was another group of young men going to raid a Sami village in the north of Norway. They didn't come in guns blazing, they actually snuck behind uh, the fortress at night and they were actually very careful not to disturb or be caught by the guards because then they would blow their horns and wake everybody up and it would have been a big mess. They did end up uh, waking everybody up and they had to run away with the treasure, all of it that they could carry back to the ship while they were being chased. And this is how the vast majority of raids went in the Viking Age. You know, really violent ones. We barely have any detailed records of these in the Norse sources. Don't get me wrong, raids are mentioned hundreds of times, but whenever they write about it, it's just simple. They said they went raiding or harrying. Uh, it's translated to a lot of the time. Uh, they harried all summer, or even more common, they collected tribute. They went to the same location each year, maybe, and collected tribute for the chieftain or for the king. It got violent sometimes, because sometimes the native people there um, uh, fought back but overall the raids were basically just a way to collect what they wanted in the least violent way possible and again it was mostly young men. Wartime is different though. Uh, if there was a wartime or conflict, raids uh, were a lot of the time done to just provoke the enemy into making an attack. For example, when our beloved Jarl Håkon was betrayed by Harald Bluetooth, uh, and there was hostility between Norway and Denmark, then yes, Håkon and the Norwegians uh, raided uh, some of the most seasoned war veterans in the country, or even in the world at the time, they were raiding Denmark and any place that was uh, aligning themselves with Denmark. So that is one of the rare examples where we find the most seasoned of war veterans uh, going on raids, but those sources, again, don't go into any detail about how bloody it got. I'm not going to lie, though, there are a couple stories of some very bad Vikings, especially Especially in the early Viking Age, okay? In Oichtinga Saga, there was a guy named Halfdan Longleg who uh, did the kind of traditional Viking raids that you all hear of. He killed everyone, burned down the village, and he, he was actually uh, banished from the country for this by his own father, Harald Fairhair, and uh, Halfdan settled in the Oichtnes. 
And after that, he ended up messing with the wrong family, and a Jarl named Tuif Einar gave him a blood eagle in revenge, like the worst punishment. Now, we have a couple other stories like this in the early Viking Age, uh, especially in the Scottish Isles. They were known to be a place where the worst raiders made their homes, but Hild Fairhair put an end to this uh, very early by bringing his forces there and, you know, uh, annexing it and conquering it, and he brought some order and law to the place. And after that, we really don't hear a lot more about these very violent and random raids. And this was around the year 900, and the raids after that was mostly just collecting tribute. They didn't just raid random places anymore. If you have any other raids you'd like to tell about uh, from the Norse sources, please write it down in the comments. Um, uh, of course, I didn't have time to go over a whole bunch from here. The video is already going to be long enough, but the other uh, Norse records tend to be quite similar in general. But now we get to the interesting part. What did foreigners have to say about getting raided by the Vikings? Of course this is going to be a little bit different. I'm breaking it up country by country so you can see the differences. Here are a few from England. These are the most famous accounts um, as they are written in a quite a poetical and doomsday-like description. So these are the ones that have survived the ages. But here you see this has been a confusing translation, especially this one you see of rapine, which means just to forcibly seize someone's property. It has nothing to do with sexual assault, but it has been t interpreted that way forever. Uh, and these raids didn't always end well for the Vikings, though. Some Sometimes the English suddenly fought back, so it wasn't all doom and gloom. But again, these sources and raids are from the early Viking Age. In the late 800s, though, a treaty was made, um, and the raids in England stopped for the most part. So contrary to popular belief, England really did not get raided that bad. Relations between England and Denmark, and even more so England and Norway, were quite friendly in the mid, uh, and especially the late Viking Age. So England, like I said, did not get it that bad. Uh, but let's move on to Ireland. They definitely got it worse. Uh, the Annals of Ulster state that in 821 the Vikings plundered an Irish village and carried off a great number of women into captivity. And this seems like the trend from the other sources, and even the DNA evidence, especially Iceland, that has a ton of Irish female DNA. So the Irish ladies probably didn't go with them willing for the most part. Uh, they probably got uh, taken there un unwillingly. And for a time, uh, it's listed in the sources that Dublin was described as the biggest slave port in Western Europe. The Vikings also raided uh, some very old settlements, uh, inland Ireland, and even some ancient tombs. So the Irish definitely got it worse than the English, it seems. Wales, they got raided a few times, but they, they, Wales actually had a very strong history, a very strong defense. They are some tough guys. They, they fought off um, pretty much every invasion and the Anglo-Saxon invasions and the Jutes and the Vikings. Um, Wales did a very good job at defending themselves uh, for the most part, but they did get raided a couple times from some of the sources. Scotland I already spoke about and I did a whole video on um, the Viking activity in Scotland that you can watch but now to speak about France uh, from the written sources France by far got the worst Viking D of all, <laughs> all the places in Europe but back then it was Francia and a large part of Germany too um, we have tons of sources of how bad the Vikings messed up Francia First, um, uh, Normandy and how that was created. I know a lot of you know that story. Um, Rouen and Paris and the Abbey at Jumaise. I'll put these up here. I guess I can't pronounce all these things right. They were all attacked by the Vikings and the French just were not able to fend them off. So they paid them to leave, usually. Over and over and over again. Um, in 845, Paris was sieged for the first time. They paid him to leave uh, 7,000 pounds of silver. And by 926, 13 more of these payments had been documented in various Frankish sources. So constantly, you know, Frankish people paying the Vikings to just leave. Uh, we can also speak a bit about Jolo of Normandy, who you all know. Uh, in 911, eventually Jolo entered the Treaty of Saint-Clair, 
um, where he was put in charge as the Duke of Normandy, uh, specifically for the purpose of stopping further Viking attacks. So this slowed things down in France a little bit. Now, officially, the Vikings living in Normandy were under Frankish rule at the time, but they did their own thing, contrary to what the TV show says. Um, uh, they stayed peaceful for a few years there sometimes, and then they'd go right back to raiding neighboring Frankish territory. So they were really a mess there, but they did kind of stop the large-scale Viking invasions on the biggest cities in uh, modern-day France. Now, the place that got it the worst in all of Europe was the Viking raids in the Rhineland. And for good reason, okay, this was the epicenter of Frankish rule that the evil, horrible Charlemagne carried out his atrocities from against our people just a few decades before. And the Vikings raided everywhere there. They burnt everything in their path. Especially the events that we have recorded around the winter raids of 881 and 882. The Frankish King Charles III was away in Rome with all his best uh, soldiers. And that's when the big Viking armies came in. And they took most cities around there without a fight. All up and down the Rhine River and surrounding areas. They raised all these towns here. Uh, they visited Cologne in uh, January 882. And after negotiations, Cologne paid them a fortune and silver for their withdrawal but later that year they sailed down the river and they came back to Curtin the same Vikings and they demanded payment again uh, which the citizens of Curtin could not afford and that's when the city was burned to the ground. They later on desecrated St. Mary's Church, which is a cathedral now, and that's where the tomb of Charlemagne was. So they robbed it and set it on fire, and this was the final revenge mark at getting revenge on Charlemagne and the forces that did such horrible things uh, less than a hundred years before. But it didn't stop there. A smaller part of this Viking force, about 300 of them, uh, attacked uh, the largest Frankish abbey, and a band of peasants from there resisted the attackers, but it's recorded here. Uh, they were all massacred, and as a result, the Vikings set the buildings on fire, and the monastery on fire, and it all burned to the ground, since no one was left alive to fight the fire, as this source says. They killed everyone, pretty much. Another one in Easter week that same year, the Vikings burnt pretty much every religious place in the area besides the monastery of St. Paulinus and um, that one was actually spared but pretty much every other religious place was burned down. Uh, now these sources go into a lot of detail and even giving specific names and dates of upper class nobles and religious leaders that were killed and also the ones who escaped such as Archbishop uh, Bertuf. Uh, we know that these raids were actually as bloody as believed because of this because it goes into great detail. After a long period of raiding, though, the Emperor Charles III um, uh, came back from Rome and he sieged the Norsemen and they negotiated, again, a payment for the Vikings to leave. And in return, the Viking leader, Gottfried, at the time, he was baptized and given uh, Frisia, basically, to rule over. But that didn't last long. Uh, Gottfried was in charge of Frisia, but he permitted other Danish Vikings to pass by and raid East Francia once again the next year. So the Viking raids continued in East Francia for at least another hundred years. They, although not as large as they were for that first one in the winter raids of 881, and they weren't as often, of course. But um, yeah, but pretty much Francia, they got uh, all the worst perceptions and ideas of a traditional Viking raid. They're pretty much true there. It was probably brutal, but make no mistake, the Franks, just a couple generations before, did far more cruel things to convert the pagans. This is what the Saxon Wars were all about. You know, Emperor Charlemagne and his soldiers of God basically massacring and torturing their own neighbors in Saxony because they wanted to believe in a different religion than them. And the Holy Roman forces were well on their way at that time to moving up to Scandinavia to do the same. This was in the late 700s, early 800s. So these raids by the Vikings in the Rhineland and really other places in Europe too. That was kind of the only things keeping the Franks and the Roman Catholic Church at bay and it stopped them from continuing their cruelty moving up into Scandinavia. Eventually Christianity did make it into Scandinavia and did the same thing, torturing and massacring and anyone who wanted religious freedom, but the Viking raids 
on Emperor Charles III's lands in Francia and also other places. It delayed this forced um, Christianization and destruction of our people and native beliefs. It delayed it for more than a hundred years. This, these things would have probably happened right after um, the Saxon Wars, but by the Vikings doing these raids, they stretched it out and were uh, able to remain pagan for another 200 years. So, hey, I'll take it. But yeah, this is where all the stories of the most violent raids come from, the Frankish sources, pretty much all of them. But let's look at a couple uh, more countries before I finish the video. Uh, Frisia, or basically modern-day Netherlands. Between 834 and 863, the Vikings laid waste eight times to the trading post of Dorestad. It wasn't a trading post, it was a, uh, said to be the largest trading center in all of northern Europe. And the Vikings um, laid waste to it eight total times, and that also kind of kept the Roman Empire expansion uh, at bay. Uh, but other than that, Vikings were pretty friendly with the Frisians, I have to say. We can also speak about some sources in the south of Europe, because uh, the Vikings did raid there a bit too. Um, after plundering a number of coastal villages um, around Spain, they were defeated um, around the Farum uh, Brentatium uh, area in August of 844. Uh, we think this was Vikings too in uh, 859 and 860. It was Vikings that sailed through Gibraltar and raided um, a little Moroccan state of Nector and defeated a Moorish army. Um, not much else um, in Spain or the Mediterranean until 100 years later, 960s, 970s. Uh, there, a fleet of 100 ships uh, that were Vikings pillaged parts of Spain for three whole years until they were uh, finally uh, defeated and sent away. Another one records um, Portugal, a, a noble in Portugal, to clear a debt that was incurred by ransoming his daughters who were kidnapped by the Vikings. Uh, now, there are tons of other Vikings. We have lots of sources um, going and fighting in other places in the Mediterranean, like Italy, Constantinople, uh, Morocco, but most of them were not raids. They were battles, usually the Vikings hired as mercenaries. So that's a different subject, but I think... Uh, I just went over all the um, raids uh, in the Mediterranean. Finally, we can speak about the east of Europe, the Slavs. Um, the primary chronicle is the main source about all this, and it says kind of the same thing as most everywhere else um, in Europe, really. A ton, a ton of raids on the native people in the early Viking Age. It doesn't go super uh, into detail, not super violent, but they definitely um, plundered a lot and they collected tribute and even slave trade, but that faded away towards the mid-Viking Age as things got more civilized and the Vikings settled there and got integrated in the east of Europe. I did a whole video on those sources too that you can check out here. So there you go, that's what the sources say. It's different things in different places of varying reliability. Believe whatever you want to believe. I'm a bit biased maybe, <laughs> but I'm not trying to idealize. Uh, but I definitely think we need to have this side of history out there too, to get rid of the notion that the Vikings were the most cruel, evil people that existed at the time. Because in reality, you were probably safer during a Viking raid than if any other army in Europe at the time came in to conquer your village. Village. Yeah, sure, all men after they conquer an opposing force are not going to be super kind to the civilians of that land, but the Vikings did what they did for resources, power, and even self-preservation, as I mentioned in this video, whereas other forces of the time, they did cruel and unjust things to the other side because they didn't believe what they wanted them to believe. That's the difference. There's always violence, but I think the reason for the violence is even more important than the violence itself. Uh, but that's just me. Let me know what you guys think. Hope you enjoyed this video and the sources. They will all be down below if you want to read more. Uh, but that's all for today. Have a nice day.